We're in a new series that we started last week. If you missed last week, you can catch it online. The series is Holy Spirit. We are looking at who, how, what, why in terms of the Holy Spirit. Last week, we focused in on who is the Holy Spirit. And just to give you the brief recap, the Holy Spirit's a person, not a force, not a power. The Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is God. We looked at this idea that the Holy Spirit is a gift that came from the Father through the Son. The Holy Spirit is a promise that the Son made. The Holy Spirit is a stewardship responsibility that we have. It is something that we are supposed to understand how to, how to take care of, an investment that God made in us, so to speak, that we're to see increase. I, I challenged people last week to read Psalm 37 every day. Every day. If you didn't, you missed out. If you did, you understand why I asked you to read it in terms of stewardship. Because Psalm 37, as it soaked in, maybe not the first or the second or the third day, but by day six, as it soaked in, you saw what it was about. I hope that the Father said he wants our desires to be there. He wants the waiting to be there for him. He had the promises of what we're going to receive from him as we, as we steward his presence carefully. Now, what we're going to do today... <clears throat> is we're going to continue this look at the Holy Spirit. Now, you might say, well, why are we spending four, five, six weeks looking at the Holy Spirit? Well, because the Christian life is not hard. It's impossible. It's impossible for us to live the Christian life without the Holy Spirit. See, we, we just had a communion. You enter the Christian life by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Your, your eternity is sealed and settled by your faith in Jesus Christ. If you die tomorrow, today... You're going to heaven. You've got eternity with the Father. That's done by the cross. But what you do as you're waiting to die, what you're doing as you're waiting for Jesus to come again, is determined by the Holy Spirit's activity in you. It's determined by your submission, my submission to the Holy Spirit. It's all about the Holy Spirit. If we don't have the Holy Spirit, if we're not activating, if we're not stewarding, if we're not believing we're falling away short. You might be going, well, you know, I'm doing pretty well without this Holy Spirit stuff. And the truth is, you're not. You're lying to yourself. You're under deception. Talk to somebody you know, and they'll tell you you're not, probably, if they're honest with you. The idea is no matter how good you're doing, no matter how well you're doing, in fact, you are not reaching, I'm not reaching, the fullness of the potential that God has for us without this activation and power of the Holy Spirit in us. So we want to drill down today. Last week was on who he is. Today we're going to drill down on how. How the Holy Spirit comes. How to be filled. How to be equipped with this ability to live the life that Jesus called us to live, how to receive the Holy Spirit. How to receive the Holy Spirit. You go, well, I know how to receive him. I get saved and I, I receive him. True enough, there's a, a level at which that happens. Romans chapter 8 verse 9 says, if you've got Jesus, you've got the Holy Spirit. And theologically, if you really want to get down to it, you had the Holy Spirit in order to get Jesus. The Holy Spirit came in in order to open your eyes, enabling you to place faith in Jesus. Yes, absolutely, the Holy Spirit is there, or you do not know Jesus. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking today, I'm talking today, about people who do have Jesus, who do have the Holy Spirit in them, but who are still yet to receive the Holy Spirit. What we're going to do today is look at what Scripture says about this. Talk a little bit about experiences, but primarily going to look at what Scripture says about this, and what we'll see from Scripture is that the Holy Spirit, receiving the Holy Spirit, being filled with the Holy Spirit, being baptized in the Holy Spirit, is both an experience and a process. As we look at the book of Acts, and, and read through it, again, if you haven't read through the book of Acts in one or two sittings, give it a try, and just get the whole big picture. Speed read it. Don't worry about the details, and look at what's laid out there. When we look at the book of Acts, what we have is example upon example upon example of people experiencing the Holy Spirit, of people experiencing the Holy Spirit in a way that, that they can recognize. Then we see, in addition to that, <clears throat> in Ephesians chapter 5.18, that we also have the process of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 5.18, let's take a quick look at that so we set the, the foundation, the groundwork of what we're looking at with this. Ephesians 5.18, the Apostle Paul says, don't get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. So he's contrasting wine, being filled with wine, or being filled with the Spirit. Does that say more than that, or is that it? Ephesians 5.19... 
Okay, I wanna, I'm going to go a little further with it. Um, <clears throat> well, we'll go on to 519 and 20 in a second. Uh, what, what we see when we look at that is the, the, the Apostle Paul saying that, that he wants us, that we have the ability to, that we are commanded to be continually filled. It's the idea of a process that goes on, of being filled and refilled and refilled, a process where we submit to the Holy Spirit. It's a matter of something having control over us. I mean, that's a contrast with wine. When wine comes in, what happens? You can get drunk with wine, and then the wine has control over you. It has control over decisions you make. It has control over how you think. You do dumb, dumb things when it has control over you. I've been there. Some of you have too. The idea is he's saying, that's not the way to do it. Let's have the Holy Spirit come in, and instead of being filled with wine or Jack Daniels, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And let the Holy Spirit have control over you. And it's a matter of, again, not just a little bit doing the trick. The filling of the Holy Spirit is in what enables us to be in a place where the God in us has control, has control over us. And the results we see in Ephesians 5, 19 and 20 are what? The results are that we're able to love supernaturally. Love supernaturally. You go, well, I can love people okay. Think about the, the politi political scene over the past six years. The Holy Spirit enables you to love people of the opposing political party. The Holy Spirit enables you to love people who are the politicians in the opposing political party. Not agree with them, but to love them, to actually supernaturally love them. You actually get up in the morning, you go, how can I love this guy? Because the Holy Spirit, if in control, enables us to love him. Holy Spirit supernaturally brings what? Joy. Verse 19 and 20 says that. Joy, we've had a pandemic for the past couple of years. Have you consistently maintained joy through the pandemic as you had to wear the mask, as you had to go through all the, 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 the rigmarole in terms of vaccinations or argue with people about not getting vaccinated or whatever it is that was your particular point of conflict and concern? I mean, the idea is that with the Holy Spirit, we have joy in the midst of chaos and conflict and suffering. And we go on and see that it's something that, that we're to have that provides boldness also. Boldness to, to preach the gospel. So again, an experience and a process. An experience and a process that's part of a big move that God is making here. As you're taking the chronology of scripture, it's a big move that God is making from God with us to God in us. When you look at the, the history of mankind, what do you see? Go back to Genesis and you've got God in the Garden of Eden. And what happens? God dwelled among them, Adam and Eve. Dwelled among them in the Garden of Eden. You move on into Israel's trek through the wilderness and their establishment as a nation. And you see God dwelling among them in the tabernacle and in the temple. And then Jesus comes. And then we've got the big deal with Emmanuel, God with us in the flesh coming in. That's even better than the tabernacle, right? God with us. And yet... Jesus, before he leaves, before he departs as the God with us, he goes, okay, that's not all, folks. There's more to come. And in fact, what's more that's coming is better than God with us in the garden, better than God with us in the tabernacle and the temple, better than God with you as I've walked among you during these three uh, years or so of, of ministry. He says, it's going to be fantastic. Let's take a look at what he says specifically in John uh, chapter 16, verse 7. John 16, 7. I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. What's going on? He's saying the Holy Spirit's coming, and it's no longer God among you. It's no longer God with us. It's God in you. It's God in you. 1 Corinthians 6.19 brings it home in, in a, a very clear way. 1 Corinthians 6.19, or do you not know that your body, your body is now a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God and that you are not your own? I mean, think about that. This is why we're called Livingstone's Church. We're not a place of, of dead stones where God resides inside a building. We're living stones. God resides in us. Not just in us, but in everybody who names Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. It's the idea that you don't need to go. We're going to take a trip to Israel next year, again, I hope, and we're going to go and see the temple, and it's all wonderful and great, but you don't need to go to Jerusalem in order to see the presence of God. He's not there. 
It's not a matter of him being in the temple. It's not a matter of him being, you know, uh, more powerfully induced to answer your prayers if you stick little pieces of paper in the wailing wall. I'm not saying don't do that. Fine and good. But he is in you. He's in me. The Holy Spirit is in us. We are now the temple, not the stones that are put together into a building, whether in Jerusalem or in Kona, Hawaii. That's what the focus has to be in terms of where we are with this. God has set up permanent residence in us, and we need to understand that, that that's what it's all about. It's about being filled. It's about enabling us to be filled. Now, we talked about this a little bit the past couple of weeks. So how does the filling work? Is it a matter of, of the Holy Spirit already being there in fullness, and we've got to just get stuff out of the way? That is, does the Holy Spirit fill us as we empty ourselves, or is it a matter of the Holy Spirit coming in in greater fullness? You know, I've brought it up, and maybe I shouldn't have because it's gotten some people a little bit confused. I think it's both and. I mean, I think we do have to get rid of some stuff. We'll look at that in a minute in terms of how Peter preached about it in Acts chapter 2. We've got to let go of some stuff and get stuff out of the way in order to make room for the Holy Spirit. But we also have to expect, in experiential terms, more of the Holy Spirit coming in. Now, as you look at this, this causes all sorts of conflict with people in the world. It causes conflict within believers, amongst believers, because there are different views of this. You've got three primary views. Number one, you've got the the sacramental church, and I, I don't need to name what churches those are. You can figure it out for yourselves. The gift of the Holy Spirit in sacramental church is seen as virtually created with the event of water baptism, that water baptism is the event by which the Holy Spirit comes in and fills somebody, and then it's once and done. You got second view, the Protestant evangelicalism view, which is the predominant view in, in the United States today and probably in Western Christianity, and in In that view, the Holy Spirit is equated with a subconscious work of God in the new birth, which you only know because the Bible says you have it, and you only have it if you believe it. It's the idea, and it's promoted by a a lot of folks, and and Jesus-loving folks too, that, that, look... You, you aren't going to have an experience. Don't look after. Don't, don't look towards having an experience, but just understand that it's there. It's a subconscious thing that, that happens with the Holy Spirit that, that's there, and you just believe that it's there and happens subconsciously. Now, you know, that's got a ring to it, and in a way, it, it does provide an easy out. And, you know, I actually might buy into that, but for the fact of what the Bible says, but for the fact of what Acts describes as Acts goes through, again, one time after another time after another time of describing, of choosing God, choosing in the Bible to describe what it looks like when the Holy Spirit is received, what it looks like when the Holy Spirit baptizes, what it looks like when the Holy Spirit fills. And it's not subconscious in most events. Now, I'm not going to stand on my head and argue with you if you say, you know, I believe it's subconscious and I've got it and don't try to tell me I need to have anything more. If you're satisfied with that, I'm not going to do anything about it. I can't do anything about it. It's going to have to be something that you're convinced of, again, I hope, by Scripture. Then you've got the third point of view. You've got what's called or referred to as the charismatic Pentecostal point of view, and that's the one that stresses the experience of being baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now, I'd suggest to you that whether you call yourself charismatic Pentecostal or whether you call yourself a Protestant evangelical, that this last point of view is the one that is biblical. The thing is this, if you are somebody who receives Jesus Christ and you're given a Bible and you begin reading through the Bible, trying to understand what it is that the Holy Spirit's all about, I don't see any way you're going to come to any other conclusion but the third point of view, with the Holy Spirit being an experience that we have. The only way that you are not going to come to that point of view is if you are listening to what other people have told you you need to believe in terms of what this really means. In other words, we've got classes and categories and schools and, and groupings of people that, that are intent on lining up with what the leaders of that group say. You've got people that have denominations in place, churches in place, streams of, 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 of ministry in place that are telling you this is the way it is. I'm not saying we shouldn't have the humility to submit to teaching and to wisdom and to things that are passed down through the ages, but only as we compare it to what Scripture says. And if you compare it with what Scripture says and think, well, I can't see how in the world they come to where they are based on what Scripture has said, but 
I'm going to believe what these people have said anyway because they're just so much smarter than me, then what are you doing? You're denying the power of the Holy Spirit in you because part of what the Holy Spirit does, he, by the way, is the one who wrote Scripture, he gives us the ability to have Scripture illuminated and to understand, again, the basics of what's there. And I, again, propose that, that this is a basic. It, it, takes, it takes courage to stand apart from the particular group that you're aligned with theologically. Um, one of uh, the people with courage that I respect a lot is a guy named John Piper. John Piper uh, happens to be in a theological school called Reformed Theology, or Calvinism. And as a whole, they deny the gifts and power of the Holy Spirit. They deny that miracles still exist today. They will tell you, and I sat under some, some seminary classes where it was suggested to me that miracles ceased when Scripture closed, that there are no more miracles today. And the, the idea is that, that the Holy Spirit is, again, a subconscious thing that comes in and is there, but you'll never really know it. And if you do start looking to know it by the way you feel, you're just going to get in trouble. Now, John Piper, he's in that school, full on, but, but in terms of this matter of the Holy Spirit, he has written several books about it, but he says, like, one, one paragraph's great. He said, it is right for the Charismatics and Pentecostals to stress the experiential reality of receiving the Spirit. When you read through the New Testament honestly, you cannot help but get the impression of a big difference from a lot of contemporary Christian experience. For them, the Holy Spirit was a fact of experience. For many Christians today, it is simply a fact of doctrine. I mean, that's not where we want to be. Again, please hear me. I, I, we've got to learn from people who know more than we do. We've got to uh, uh, allow teachers to come in and teach us we need to, to be listening to, to what people who've been around longer than us have to say about things. But again, every single time we listen to them, we've got to compare it with what Scripture says. We've got to be like those Berean Christians that Paul talked to in, in, in the New Testament, where they checked out what he said by looking back to see what Scripture had said to make sure it, 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 it lines up. So, again... Why is it then we do express or stress this matter of the experience? Why express or stress the matter of, of the experience? Three reasons real quickly. Number one, because baptism in the Holy Spirit implies immersion. It describes something as overwhelming us, the Spirit overwhelming us. It's not a picture that's given in Scripture of taking up inconspicuous residency in us but, but one where we know that something has happened. Uh, number two, we, we see in, in Acts chapter 1, verses 5 and 8, that, that power and boldness comes through this experience. Jesus talked about it. I mean, let's look at Acts chapter 1, verses 5 and 8, just real quickly as we, again, continue to try to just lay this foundation here. In Acts chapter 1, Verse 5, Jesus is talk, talking to the disciples. This is before his ascension into heaven and before the day of Pentecost. He says, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized, immersed, completely overcome with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. He's saying there's going to be an event that happens. And then verse 8, and you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And with that power, then you're going to be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest parts of the earth. So again, Jesus is talking about an experience of power, of boldness, and, and the idea is that a Christianity without power, or a Christian without power, is basically, I think, described here as a Christian who needs the Holy Spirit. A Christian who, who feels lacking in power is a Christian who just needs the Holy Spirit again, perhaps, in, in terms of that, that experience coming into play. And then number three, number three, we want to stress the experience of it because it's a testimony, again, of the entire book of Acts. Read through the entire book of Acts. Every time the Holy Spirit works in believers in Acts, it's never subconscious. 
the Holy Spirit in Acts is never a silent influence, but an experienced power. It's a life-changing experience. It's, it's one where the Apostle Paul, again in uh, Acts chapter 19 two, um, asked believers, new believers in Ephesus, um, um, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you were baptized? I mean, think about this. Try to get the context here. Apostle Paul, he's had this experience. He's had this miraculous confrontation with Jesus on the road to Damascus. He's struck blind. He then has this guy, Ananias, who comes in to praise for him. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. And a few days later, he's out preaching Jesus as, as Savior, as God. Anyway, fast forward 20 years, Acts chapter 19, they get word that there are believers now in Ephesus. He goes to Ephesus, and he says to the people who have received Jesus as Savior, he says to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Now, is that what you'd ask somebody that, that testifies that they've recently come to Jesus Christ? Is that the first question that you would ask somebody if they, if they say, yeah, I'm a believer. I'm a follower of Jesus now. He's my Savior and my Lord. Paul, first question he asks is, did you get the Holy Spirit too? I mean, it's like something else is involved. Something else is involved. Now, let's flip the script and let's say we're the ones who have become Christians, who've received Jesus, and we've got them, some crazy Paul coming into our life, and we, we have been coming to church now for maybe a couple of years, and we've received Jesus as Savior, and we're following him as best we know how, and then some guy comes in and says, I, I hear you're a new believer. You go, yeah, I am. I've trusted Jesus. I'm saved. I'm, I'm forgiven. I'm, I'm following Jesus as a disciple. And he says, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And for the most part, in Protestant evangelicalism, what's going to be the response? Well, of course I did. Of course I did. It was part and parcel of my salvation, of my conversion. I received him then. And your answer is partly correct, but it's not correct in terms of what Paul was asking because he was asking specifically what the experience had happened. He knew the Holy Spirit was already there if they were trusting Jesus Christ for salvation. He's the one who wrote Romans chapter 8, verse 9. But he was saying, has the experience happened? Have you had this experience come in, this real experience? You know, in uh, something called cybernetic theory, it's a branch of psychology that looks at change in people. There are two kinds of changes that come in in life. There is first-level change, and first-level change is behavioral change. And that is an incremental process of change where, you know, we diet, we exercise, we do things, and it works to help things change incrementally. But then there's something else called second-order change, and that's a quantum change, a quantum change that happens all at once. It's a paradigm shift that happens. It's something that happens when you experience something that changes everything about how you view life in the world. Now, this, this matter of... of <coughs> excuse me. This matter of cybernetic theory is non-Christian. It's complete worldly psychology. But it is so true in terms of, of the application of what we're looking at here that, yes, we can have incremental change that comes in as we pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and memorize scripture and try to walk out in obedience to commands that we have. But a second-order change is what Jesus promoted. In fact, what God commands us to have in, in life, a second-order change change that, that is a quantum change that comes in that completely, completely alters the perspective we have of, of reality and life and how it all works. And it's this, this is a matter of the Holy Spirit, the experience of being filled, baptized. I mean, choose your term and we can at some future date talk about the, the minor distinctions between being filled, being baptized, have the Holy Spirit come upon you. Don't get caught up in that right now. It's the idea that that's the quantum change. Once it's happened, once you have had, if you have had the experience, it changes everything. It changes the perspective that you, you have in terms of, of how you walk out life, and I know it did for me. I mean, I, I have tell you how it worked for me, and most of you have heard it before if you've been here more than a year, but, but my testimony is the only testimony I own. I'm not going to share yours because I don't believe half of your testimonies. But the idea with it for me is I was raised in a Christian home, raised Baptist, knew who Jesus was, knew the, the gospel plan, believed in heaven and hell, 
But as soon as I got my driver's license, I was just out of there, not leaving home, basically, but going my own way, doing my own thing. And that continued until I was in my, my mid-20s. And I was just, I don't need to tell you all the bad stuff, but it was bad. And so I'm in my mid-20s, I'm in my first year of law school, and I am disgusted with myself, pure and simple. I, I had moved away from the influence of the circle of friends that I'd been with for several years. I was by myself, and I was just thinking, you know, this is not who I'm supposed to be. This is not what God wants me to be. This is not how I'm supposed to live. I can remember very clearly, got down on my knees by my bed in this little studio I was renting, and I said, Jesus, I don't know exactly what I'm supposed to do now or how I'm supposed to do it, but I receive you now. Really, really, I receive you as my Savior, as my Lord. You're in charge of my life. I'm giving it up. Help me. Help me get rid of all this junk in my life and give it up. And the process began. And it was a process. And I, I made some choices. And in the strength that I had, I was saying no to the choices that I needed to say no to. But very quickly after that, I was exposed to a, a charismatic church, and this whole matter of the Holy Spirit started coming into play. Now, a lot of what I heard in that charismatic church, I, I jettisoned, and I continue to reject today because some of it was just junk. But a lot of it, I mean, it was right on in terms of the power, the gifts, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, and, and how that operated. So, okay, this all happens. Exp uh, I'm exposed to this, and then <clears throat> I'm a... Um, out of law school, and I begin going to this, this church. And it's a church that is sound in doctrine, but also spirit-filled. They believe in the gifts and the power of the Holy Spirit. They believe in the baptism, the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And we're all divided up into small groups. Everybody in the church was in a small group. If you weren't in a small group, you weren't part of the church. And so in the small group, everybody in the small group, about 18 people in the small group, all of them filled with the Holy Spirit, smart people, knew their Bibles inside out. And I'm sitting there, and I'm thinking man, I, I don't want to be outed as somebody who is spirit-less right now. So I didn't confess to anybody that I'd never had this experience that they'd had. And I struggled along with them for a year, and, and my wife and I, she was trying to help me through this process, and I was praying, I mean, daily, really, daily, I was praying, Holy Spirit, come, fill me, do what you need to do, change me, hurry before they get the clue that I don't, you know, line up with, with where they all are. And anyway... Nothing happened, really. I, I continued to seek earnestly. I really wanted it. And then uh, summer came. Uh, actually, I was still in law school at this point. Summer came, and I had an internship uh, with a judge in another city. So we go to the other city, and the first thing we did when we got there was I just looked for the craziest charismatic church I could find because I knew how they did things. I'd seen them on TV. You know, they, they call people down and pray for them to receive the Holy Spirit. So I... I Go to the front right at the end because they're saying two things. If you want to know Jesus as Savior, come on down. If you want to be filled or refilled with the Holy Spirit, come on down, and we'll take care of it for you today. So I came down real quickly. These two ladies were down there. I said, I want to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I want to get filled with the Holy Spirit. I don't know what to call it, but I want whatever God has for me. They said, do you want to receive the gift of tongues? I said, I'll get whatever God has for me. I want to get. I want to have. And so they prayed for me. And... I received the experience of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And with tongues, they, they said, repeat after me, hallelujah. And I said it, and the more I said it, the more tied up my tongue got, and then other things were coming out of my mouth besides hallelujah. And since then, people said, well, that was very manipulative. It just got your tongue tied, so you were blah, 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 blah. I don't care. Because after that, daily, as I'm driving into the judge's office, I got the windows up, the air conditioner on, and I'm just practicing this matter of speaking in tongues. Now, let me back up, because some of you have lost you already. The idea with, with tongues is it's not a gift that everybody gets. It's not the mark of being filled with the Holy Spirit, but it's one that commonly comes in as a gift of the Holy Spirit. The whole idea is there's an experience. For me, it was that, but it followed by other instances where I'm praying for God just to come in and let me experience your presence. Holy Spirit, let me experience your presence. And, and it's the overwhelming sense of the love of the Father that comes in. It's the idea that God knows me. He knows my name. I'm just not part of some monolithic entity called the church where we're all going to in mass get levitated up to heaven when Jesus returns. He knows my name. He knows where I am. He knows how I'm struggling. I mean, for goodness sakes, look at the mercy he had on me. I'm so prideful, I won't ask people in a small group to pray for me to receive 
receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, receive the, the infilling of the Holy Spirit, and I wait until I leave town and go to strangers so they don't know me, so I'm not out at a poser, and God allows that. He has mercy on that. He wants us so badly to have the fullness of his presence. He wants us to fulfill the purposes that he's got for us in life. And it changes everything. That's a quantum change. That's a second level change. That is the plan, the plan that God has for all of us. This is why Jesus talked to the disciples the way he did in John 14 through 17, right before he, he goes to the cross. He says, look guys, this is the plan. I'm leaving, the Holy Spirit's coming, it's better. He's not just with you, he's in you, and he's gonna equip you to finish the mission that I've started, to fulfill, to fulfill the purposes that I have for the coming generations. And, and we can't go and try to find some alternative plan, some alternative method for, for this to, to, to happen. I, I've lost time. Time got away from me. I haven't lost it. It just got away from me. Um, <laughs> if you look through the book of Acts, I mean, just look at the accounts in the book of Acts. You've got, you've got the, the day of Pentecost with Peter preaching. And Peter preaches in Acts chapter 2 on, on what's going on there. He's the guy who just a few days before had been denying that he even knew Jesus for a few weeks before. And then he stands on the street corner in Jerusalem with all of the people who love to kill him around preaching the gospel and then doing it with such power that, that people are trembling, saying, what shall we do? And in verse 38, Peter says, repent, change your minds about things, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. Then you fast forward from that, and you see the same thing happen in Samaria. Samaritans received the gospel for the first time in Acts chapter 8, and word gets back to the apostles in Jerusalem that they received it. What's the first thing they say? Go and get them filled with the Holy Spirit. And they send Peter and John to go to Samaria and do what? Lay hands on the Samaritan believers to get them filled with the Holy Spirit. Cornelius comes, and, you know, you got the first Gentile that's, that's coming in saying, what do I do with all this? And you got Peter that goes to Cornelius' house and preaches the gospel again to Cornelius and his whole family, including the servants, and what happens? The Holy Spirit falls, interrupts Peter's sermon, for goodness sakes. The Holy Spirit falls and fills, in an experiential way, the people that are gathered together in, in Cornelius' household. Same thing happens again with what we just looked at in Acts chapter 19. We see it with the Apostle Paul. In each instance, we see this, this experience coming in. So, the question is, how can we do something with this? How can we be filled? And the answer to being filled, to being baptized, to being refilled, to being rebaptized, is a matter of faith, and surrender. Uh, Colossians chapter 2, 6 said that as you received Jesus, so walk in him. The, the matter of the Christian life is one of faith from beginning to end. Romans 1, 17 says the Christian life is all about faith in the promises of God. And the main promise that we have of God is this promise of, this promise of the Holy Spirit. Faith is giving up control and actively holding on to these promises and letting him take control in our lives, asking for something that we know it's God's will to give us. In, in 1 John, we're told that if we ask for something that we know is God's will, then we can know that we have the request that we have asked of him. That means we can have absolute faith in it. I'm not sure of much else that God is more clear about in his promises than this matter of the Holy Spirit and receiving the Holy Spirit. And so it's a matter of asking him for that. So what I'd like to do right now, and you participate as you'd like to, is to go through a quick five-step process that'll take us less than five minutes on receiving the Holy Spirit or on receiving again the Holy Spirit. Receiving the Holy Spirit is something that has to be attended to directly. It's not something that 
ever appears to have happened accidentally. It's an openness that comes in. Even in Cornelius' situation, you say, well, that happened accidentally. Well, no, it didn't. They were pursuing God. They had a desire for all that God had for them. So what I want to do is just go through a quick process here and then encourage you to get additional prayer later if you would like to from prayer ministry team, from your small group, by calling somebody up that you know that has received the Holy Spirit themselves and just having somebody else pray with you. Now, I want to tell you that I personally do not believe that the gift, the baptism, the filling of the Holy Spirit has to happen on a Sunday morning in a prayer line with a particular methodology in place. Often happens that way. But, I mean, again, look through the, through the book of Acts, talk to other people. It happens in all sorts of different ways. It often happens on Sunday mornings. It happens in the Alpha Course. It happens in small groups. I've seen people in small groups in the Alpha Course and on Sunday mornings get filled with the Holy Spirit, and it's a wonderful thing. But I also know people who have been washing dishes in front of their kitchen window, and they're praying and have been praying for months for this baptism of the Holy Spirit, and they fall out flat with nobody around to witness this, so it's not an exhibition of any kind, but with the Holy Spirit coming in and baptizing them while they're washing their dishes, for goodness sakes. God can do what God wants to do. It's not something, again, that has to follow a particular pattern, but I do think there's some things we can look at in Scripture and consider. Number one, number one, first requirement, I think, for being filled, baptized in the Holy Spirit is that, you, that you've had a conversion experience, that you know Jesus that you do know Jesus as Savior. That is the ultimate. That is the most important thing, to know Jesus, to know that you're a sinner separated from God by your sin and that you have received Jesus Christ as the Savior who died for you and that you know that you are an adopted son or, or daughter of the living God. Number two, number two is, is having faith. And this is a question to ask yourself, do you have faith in the promises of God, particularly faith in the promise of the Holy Spirit? Do you believe that God has promised that to you? And are you willing to operate in a faith that, that refuses to conform with what might be the majority opinion of people around you, that refuses to conform with, with anybody who tells you differently because you see that this is something that the Bible says? Do you have a faith that's ready to break out of heuristic bias? Heuristic bias is just a fancy way of saying habits of thinking. Heuristic bias is, is the default position we all take to doing things the way we've always done them, to thinking the way we've always thought. Right now, some of you need to say, Holy Spirit, help me break out of thinking the way I've always thought. The biblical word for that is repentance, changing our minds. So receiving Jesus, having faith. And then number three, simply asking for the Holy Spirit to come in. Let's take a look real quickly at Luke 11, verses 11 to 13. Now suppose one of your fathers is asked by his son for a fish. He will not give him a fish, give him a snake instead of a fish, will he? Or if he asks for an egg, he will not give him a scorpion, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? I've always thought that that was, quite honestly, a very weird teaching by Jesus. And I personally do not think that it had so much application to his disciples then as he knew it was going to have application to his disciples today. I don't think that they had so much of a question then about asking the Holy Spirit in and they were going to get something weird. I think that's something he foresaw as being the situation today where we've gotten convinced by misinformation that's come in that has told us that this is a dangerous thing, that you'll get off into emotionalism, that you get off into all sorts of weird stuff. That's a lie. Emotionalism, yeah, there's some emotion involved. There's feeling involved. But all within the confines of what Scripture has described God wants for us. Number, number three, then we ask. Number four, we thirst. There needs to be a desire for it. I mean, if you're sitting here and you go, well, I'll give it a try today, and if it doesn't work, you know, that means God didn't want it for me. That's not thirsting. That's not a desire. That's not what, that's not what faith even looks like. Uh, John chapter 7, verses 37 to 39, uh, Jesus again said, Now on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. What's he talking about? Well, he goes on to tell us. By this he spoke of the Holy Spirit 
whom those who believed in him were to receive. Their spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. It's a matter of a desire, of a thirsting, of a seeking after that continues on, that keeps pressing, that keeps pressing in. And then finally, number five, receiving. Again, the receiving isn't passive, but it's, it's active. It's a gift to be received. It's something that, again, often involves repentance, as Peter said. It's a removing of, of barriers. It's a, a removing and a repenting and a letting go and a changing our mind about attitudes, about actions, about ways we've thought and believed before. So what I would just suggest right now is everybody stand up. And again, by standing up, you're not committing to anything. You're not doing anything except standing up. And you've been sitting long enough for that ought to be a relief and a joy. And, and let's just pray through this real quickly together. And I'd, I'd suggest if you want to receive the infilling of the Holy Spirit now for the first time or receive it again for a fresh filling, then you can have your hands out and have that as an acknowledgement before God. Father, we do thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, as our Savior. We believe that you have made a promise of your Holy Spirit, that you made that promise, Lord Jesus, repeatedly, and we believe it's a promise that you want to give to us as your children. And I ask right now for you to help us break apart for conformity from bias that we've had in terms of doing things the way we've always done them. And now we together come to you and we ask you, send your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, fill us fresh. Holy Spirit, baptize us. Some for the first time, give us that rebaptism, that immersion in the reality of your power, of your love. Let us have the love of the Father wash over us in a real sense that, that we can experience, that we can grab hold of as that quantum change that so many of us need. We, we do desire this. We express this desire with with this matter of simply standing before you, but we, uh, we're going to continue to express it each day as we continue to seek for more, for more of what you have to enable us to fulfill the mission you've put us here to accomplish. And we just say we receive what you have for us today. We receive it as a good gift. We receive it as a gift of power. We receive it as a gift, as the influencer upon our lives that surpasses all other influence. We receive you, Holy Spirit, and just ask you to come and fill us up fresh now. Equip us for the purposes that you have for us. Release the gifts you have. Release the gifts you have. Tongues, prophecy, teaching, evangelism, whatever the gift is you want released, I ask for the release of those gifts now, enabling us to be the people you intend for us to be. We just pray your grace and blessings and power on us now, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.